Good morning. Howdy. Well, I understand. Are we not studying the, ver- the last book of the Bible? Oh, the first one. So, oh, gracious. I taught that before. That was a big mistake. Yeah, that's when I leave. Yeah, because everybody wants to study Revelation until they actually study it. And then they go, oh, well, because uh, Revelation is really hard. And, it re- and, it, and you know, the, uh, John expects you to know the Old Testament, which most people don't know very well. As we make our way through Genesis, I'll give you a spare just in case. Uh, I'm going to try to cover at least one chapter per lesson, maybe more, because otherwise, I mean, Genesis has, what, 50 chapters or something like that? So, you know, and if I go at my regular pace, which is, you know, like half a chapter or lesson, that's over a year. We can't, we're not, we're not going to do that, okay? So, um, so we're not going to go, you know, proceed at the usual depth that we may often do for some of our lessons, but we'll cover the main things and, uh, and we'll still have time for questions, okay? So, I don't think Genesis is a very hard book to find in Scripture, is it? Just, yeah, you open it up and there it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, so Betty's saying it's probably the most read book because if you open it, there it is. All right. So, um, so without much further ado, let's kind of press on, shall we? Okay. So, uh, Lorna is, is here. Uh, so I'm welcome. So, um, so I have a little introduction. So we're not having a whole introductory lesson, just a little introduction, and then we press on to chapter one. Okay. So Genesis starts out in our English translation in the beginning, right? Um, and it's a compound word with a preposition, meaning with or by means of, and reshit, which is something like the first cause or, or something along those lines. So it could be translated in the beginning. It could be when God began to create a whole slew of things. And grammatically, those are all kind of fine translations. In fact, I would prefer when God began to create, except some of the higher critics kind of like that. And that's not why I don't, that's not why I like it. I just like it because I think that's the best rendering. Okay. But um, so what we'll find out is that God creates things, but he creates a world in which what he creates is able to reproduce and sustain itself. Okay, so that is kind of made known right there in the very beginning. So, So we'll recognize that God is our creator. And yet, how did we all come into being? Well, mom and dad. And how did our mom and dad? Oh, from their mom and dad, see? So it goes all the way back to God's creation, but that's built in, see? And so we can kind of get that from the the very first compound word in Genesis, okay? If you kind of look at a lot of the stuff, how people have responded to it, because, you know, um, modern science has really had an impact on a lot of our, a lot of biblical scholarship because what does science say in relation to what scripture says? Well, science comes up with a whole bunch of other things concerning how we came into being. Now, it's all theory or hypothe- hypotheses, right? But it's the best that science can give us. Okay, and so a a lot of biblical scholars go, well, you know, uh, what's written in Genesis uh, doesn't really kind of match the best of what science can give us so far. And so they'll kind of let that influence how they understand Genesis. So, you know, so people, well, it's it's myth or God is giving us to try to set, giving us this information to try to satisfy our curiosity. He's not really telling us what really happened, right? So we're not going to go down that road. We're going to treat it as historical, 
and yet we're also going to respect the rhetoric that's being used. It's also poetry. We're going to respect both. So, because if we don't respect the rhetorical forms that are being used, that is also, that also diminishes our understanding of the text. So we're going to, we're going to do both, okay? We're not going to walk the, 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 the high wire the, the critics do, the higher critics do, think, ah, this is all myth. But neither are we going to go fundamentalist and just go, well, are they seven literal days and nothing else matters, Okay? So we're not, we're not going either direction. We're going to honor, right, the historicity and the rhetorical forms. Are we good? Yeah, because I, I really like doing that because I learn so much when I do that, okay? So I have, a, I have a really quick little outline of Genesis, just the basics, right? So we kind of have ancient history. That's chapters 1 through 11, Okay, or we can even see that as a prelude to God, what? Establishing things for Israel to bless the world. Okay, so it's, it's um, literally, is that a word? It kind of sets the stage to prepare us for Israel and how God will bless the world through Israel. So that's kind of, that's kind of, um, stirring within the text of the first chapters, even though that's not the content itself, okay? And then after that, it's what? Patriarchal history, right? Uh, descendants of Terah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Right? And then, boop, okay. So I didn't say, I said 50 chapters. Well, that's not right. But Oh, yeah, it is right, Okay. So are we good? Are we ready right now to jump in? So let's plug our nose, jump into the cold pool, and start swimming. Uh, do you do you remember this guy named Bishop Usher? Well, I mean, not personally, but he was he was an Anglican bishop back in I don't know, a few hundred years ago, who ca who added up all he looked at the different genealogies and then calculated that the earth was created in like 5,000 BC or something, right? Um, you know, the thing is when you look at the different genealogies though, they all have, they all don't match exactly. Because each genealogy, genealogies serve other purposes than simply saying, oh, well, who, you know, who are my ancestors? Right? And so when you look at, say, Jesus' ancestry, you see three groups of 14. And yet the time periods of each group of 14 are of different lengths. So you go, okay, so, which means that the genealogy skipped a lot of people. Okay? But the point is what? Um, these are the people that Matthew wants you to know who are ancestors of Jesus, and what does that mean? Okay? So. If I were, so I would say, okay, so you factor in all that stuff, the genealogies don't list every single person in, because they're not genealogies as we think they are. They serve other purposes. So I would, I would think the earth is probably 25,000, 30,000 years old. That would be my hunch just based on that. But I can't prove that, yeah. right? And that's just kind of my estimation of how many people were skipped? You know, who, who, who wants to be highlighted in a particular genealogy, okay? So uh, I'm going to say, in a sense, it doesn't really matter, okay? We don't want to take away the historicity of this, right? But it's Genesis, it's really telling us who God is and how he did stuff, okay? So it's, it's not really giving us specific dates. Now we can calculate some of the stuff when we look at some of the ages of some of the people who lived, okay? So I can't give you a specific date like in the beginning, oh, well that was, we don't know, okay? So, and I just don't want to make something up either. Okay, so uh, let's, we're going to look at Genesis 1, 1, and 2, and I call that the prequel, Okay. In other words, it starts, out with, it starts out as a topic sentence, and then actually the rest of creation kind of fills in what verse 1 states. 
okay? So I'm not going to look at verse one as day one, but I'm not going to say, oh, but it was billions of years before. No, okay? So verse one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so verse three and following is how God did that, okay? Topic sentence. And plus, um, the way it kind of starts out, you know, it's an introductory, and it's a particular, it's a verb form, which, which basically always kind of, you know, it, it's written in a way that denotes that something else will be getting underway, and that's the creation itself, okay? So that's the reason why I kind of call this the, the preview or the prequel or the whatever, these first two verses, okay? And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So this is kind of what is there at the very beginning when God says, okay, I'm going to create stuff. Okay, and, and how is the earth described? Form and void. Darkness was over the face of the deep. So it doesn't, things just kind of, it seems like it's stuff's just like a jumbled mess, isn't it? Okay, and so God will order it and structure it so that way it is not this. Okay, now the text doesn't say, well, where did this, where did this stuff without form and void, where did this come from? It came from God. Okay, so he has, he has created the very beginnings from which he will now make the rest of creation. And what we will see is we're going to notice word usage. We're going to notice the word made, and we're going to notice the word create. So create basically is used first, and that's God speaking something into existence which did not exist. And then God makes, which means that he takes something that he already spoke into existence and uses that as the foundation to, to make something else. So notice, so let's kind of notice that when we make our way through the text, okay? Create and make. And the ESV does a good job of, of translating those. It's not mixing and matching, so it's not going to lead to any confusion, okay? So a couple things to note on page two, created, okay? Uh, I already talked about that, it's ex that the form it is, and it's expecting us to, to know the rest of the story which will be happening. But the word for heavens, get this, it's interesting because it's really what? It's, the re it's really a compound word, two words, the word for there is and waters. What? So what is the text saying? That the heavens or the sky or it is made of water? Yes. And so we will find that out later when we talk, it, when it describes kind of this uh, kind of water, kind of um, dome covering, covering the earth, okay? And so the word itself for heavens originates from that. So, and we would never know otherwise unless you kind of go to the root words and stuff, okay? There's a whole lot of stuff kind of in the words that just kind of open up an understanding of things. And so just the word for heavens, and then of course that ends up and kind of continues on and, and it just becomes that even though its original meaning is there is water. Okay, see? So on page two, a little box, God's poetry in the beginning. Okay. In creation's opening words, we come across Hebrew poetry. God described the universe's mass before he further formed it as tohu vabohu. So you can kind of tohu vabohu, it's uh, right? Right there, it just sounds like a, like a combobulated sort of thing. Tohu vabohu. This may be a nonce phrase, something used only for this occasion to have, a se to have the second word reinforce the first by rhyme and re-emphasis. Tohu vabohu like hocus pocus, right? I mean, that sort of 
Uh, tohu itself means emptiness or futility. Okay. Vobohu means, well, it's a compound word. And va, bo in it, who there is. So even though the King James says it was void, fo- how does the King James, it was void and waste or? Anyways, um, vabohu is not an exact repeat of tohu, okay? So things are a combobulated mess, but within that mess, there is the potential for much more. And that's what, and that's what vabohu kind of has lurking in the text or lurking in the meaning of the word. So two words in a poetic phrase emphasize that the world was without purpose and a mixed up mass of matter. But not only, for within the swirling matter lay something much more which God will further form and shape for his purposes. Okay? So right there when we hear the earth is what? Formless or formless void. You go, oh yeah, but not only. Because in that mess is potential which God will bring out. I have a question. Okay? Oh yeah. Otherwise it didn't how did it come into existence? So, you know, so God is the creator, okay? And we will see, okay, God speaks stuff into being. If we kind of look at how uh, how God structures creation, so in the middle of page 2, we can kind of see it taking place in two parts or two phases. Phase 1, we can see day 1 light and darkness, sky waters, dry land and plants. Phase two, luminaries, the sun, moon, and the stars. So it's, we can see how four kind of is the fulfillment of day one. Sky and water is the fulfillment, flying animals and sea creatures. So he creates this, but now he populates it with stuff. And then dry land and plants, land animals and humans. See, So he creates and then he fills it with his creatures, okay? So right there we can kind of learn what we're going to find out that the creation account teaches us that God is a God of structure and a God of order. We will see that over and over, repeated over and over again, okay? We'll especially see that at the end of each day, okay? So this lets us know the direction which God is moving in. He's taking this tohu va blah, 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 tohu va bohu, and he's making it into something wonderful, structured and ordered with purpose and being, okay? And so what we'll find out is when we kind of look at the fall and fall and sin and everything else, that's chaos and destruction. It's trying to undo what God did and does, okay? So, Okay. Let's look at day one. So, Genesis 1 tree. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Okay. So, God said it, and it exists. Okay. So, um, this is how, I'm going to quote several, several passages from the Apocrypha, because it's the, only, it's the only biblical text, if you want to look at this Greek language Septuagint, that actually covers certain aspects of creation that the Hebrew language Old Testament does not. Okay? So, 2 Maccabees 7.28. Look at the heaven and earth, see everything in them, and recognize how God made them out of what did not exist. So, it's called creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. Okay. And Second Maccabees is the only place that states that directly, that God created stuff out of something, out of nothing. God can do that. He's God. And here it is, light. And there was light. So let's see, well, what else? Romans 4, 17, I have made you Abraham the father of many nations in the presence of the God whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. See, So this is, Romans is saying that God calls things into existence that do not exist, but it doesn't state directly that he 
speaks something out of nothing. He's creating things that don't exist yet. Okay? Um, so how did God create what he created? He spoke it into being. So this is, this is important. Okay? Because especially when we get to the creation of Adam. Okay? So uh, let's look at verses 4 and 5. And God saw that the light was good. You notice we'll, we'll see that refrain that things are good. Tov. And God separated the light from the darkness. Okay, so there you have it. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Well, if we want, if we want to just, let's get, let's get a little creative and let's kind of get to the, closer to the root meanings. And there was evening, which is also the word for disorder or chaos. And the word for morning is also the word for order or structure. And so it's kind of like when you think in the evening, our ability to see is kind of diminished, right? If you kind of look at the, how our eyes function, you have the rods and the cones and whatever. And so we can see at night, but our ability to see at night is much diminished compared to what we see in the day. So it's, you know, the, so it's kind of tapping into that, okay? But, so evening and morning, yeah, that's, that's accurate, but it's not getting into the kind of the root word of disorder and order. See, that's the direction God is moving in, from disorder to order, okay? And then it doesn't really say the first day, it really says one day. It's kind of really what the text says, not the first day. So there was chaos and order one day. So there you have it. That's what God is doing. Okay? Let's see what happens in day two. And you notice it'll say that every after every day, evening and morning, chaos or disorder to order. Okay? So it's, it keeps every single day that's, that's, hammering that point home. Our God is a God of order. Okay. So let's look at day two. Verses six through eight. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. So remember the word for heaven it has the word water in it. So now God is what, right? He's not just light and day, but what? He's separating what is above the earth to what is below, okay? And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. So he's, God is sorting stuff, okay? He's, he's arranging it so that way the world can be populated with beings. Right now it can't be because it's still too close to Tohu Vabohu. Joyce, question? Okay, yeah. You know, so in most languages the word for heaven and sky is the same word. Yeah. Yeah. Now, English is different because I think sky comes from, I think that may come from like kind of the Norse influence, I think. So, because l English in many ways is kind of a pidgin language where we've adopted so many words and whatnot from other languages, we kind of have a fairly broad vocabulary. So, it's not weird that tr it translates sky or heaven. It's the translators, they're just going, well, should we translate, you know. And so, normally we think of heaven as, Oh, you know, where God is. And, and so sky is sky's accurate here. I think heaven is broader in meaning. It, heaven, in a general usage, can mean sky, but not only sky. Kind of like create and make, right? So um, when you create something, you make something. But n making something is not the exact same thing as creating something. So make is more broad. Heaven is more broad than sky. Okay? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's water above. And so we'll, we'll find that when we get to the flood. So God just <laughs> lets loose all the water. And, <laughs> and there's, there's a little bit of tohu vabohu going on. Okay. So, uh, but that's, I think that's in six, seven, eight, whatever. Okay. All right. So now notice that God made. Did you catch that in these verses? He, not the word create. Asa, not bara. Okay. And God made. Okay. So the point here is that what he earlier spoke into being, he is now using to what? Make other stuff. Okay. So, so this does not take away from God being the creator, but it's showing that just like when he made Adam, he used what he already made to make Adam. Okay? So, day three. Okay, this is verses 9 through 13. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let dry land appear. So, right? So it's becoming less and less of a tohu. It's becoming less tohu and more vabohu. In other words, the potential that exists and all the stuff that God spoke into being is now showing itself. Okay? So now we, we see kind of land, not just whatever. You know, the chaos of all this watery stuff all mixed together. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Okay, now, okay, we're going to get into what's going to live on the stuff God creates. Okay, so starting with verse 11. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. The tohu continues to diminish and the potential in the vabohu continues to increase. Disorder to order. Chaos to structure. And there was evening and there was disorder and there was morning, order, one day, the third day. Okay? So, there we have that. Okay? On page three, uh, there's a little bit more poetry just to kind of, we can kind of delight in this. So verse 11, so it contains three doublets, okay? So, and God said, let the earth sprout with sprouts, plants that seed forth seeds, fruit trees that bring forth fruit. You would almost say, isn't it kind of redundant that fruit trees bring forth fruit? That's what fruit trees do, right? And this gets me to think, is God simply being redundant or is there more to this? Think about the cinnamon tree, right? We use the bark for cinnamon. You could also use the leaves, right? So in other words, the tree itself has value. And it makes me think, for the ruin of sin that perhaps the entire tree was edible. I don't know. It doesn't say, but I'm trying to think, if God's not being redundant, is the true it, tree itself like a fruit, which also bears fruit? Okay. And, and the whole fruit stuff will come through when God tells you know, Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. So we'll, we'll get to that, okay? But it's just, just kind of gets me thinking that the goodness, that when God says that it was good, it's probably a, way, a lot more gooder, a lot better than we imagine. Because what do we know? All we know is the best that this fallen creation has, which over, 
over time we've improved upon, right? Through selective breeding and this and this and that. But yet, right, we're still dealing with a fallen world. Like, wow, what was it? How good was it in the very beginning? Very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, well, the text is vague enough where it allows aspects, please hear me out on this, aspects of what I would call evolution, but really micro changes within um, creatures or species. So each thing according to its kind, that's a broad term. It doesn't really mean species. Okay, it's more general than that. But the thing that, that, that throws kind of evolutionary theory out the door is that it's based on death, right? And God is a God of life. Death did not yet exist, and so he's moving from disorder to order. See? So that's totally contrary to God's way of working. And to me, not... I mean, because the text is not, it's not a science textbook. So it's vague enough where you can say, well, it could mean this and it could mean that. But overall, it doesn't match because evolution requires death, which did not exist until the fall into sin. Okay? So, so yeah, so it does not allow for that despite kind of the poetic and kind of... Uh, loose grammar that allows kind of broader interpretations. And that's what a lot of the higher critics do. They'll look at, well, it could mean this, and it could mean that. But you look at the, the whole sweep of it, and you go, but that's not who God is. See? And it's very clear. God, he's, everything that God is doing, he's, it's which direction is he going in? See? It's always, it's going in a better direction. See? And so he, so he started, but he just didn't go, let there be, and then everything is as it is. See, so he creates whatever he uses initially and then uses that. So I could see how some people could use that as a springboard for kind of evolution. Well, it says here that God did this, and now, right? And yeah, that's possible if you discount a lot of other stuff in the text, but you'd have to be a really bad reader, okay? And we're letting the text influence where we're running with these things, okay? Not, well, that contradicts science. Well, we're studying Genesis. We're not taking a biology class, okay? So, are we ready for day four? So now kind of phase two, God's going to start populating the stuff that he made, okay? So uh, 14 through 19, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day. What is that? The sun. The lesser light to rule the night. What is that? The moon. Yeah. So I, I put this in the lesson, but the interesting thing is the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun. And yet, what happens? You, you, it's, it's the same size as the sun from our perspective because it's 400 times closer. And so that's how we can get a full eclipse because they're like, bloop. And so, so from, our, from our vantage point, they're the same size, okay? So you can kind of see that this is telling us how God did stuff, but it's from what we would call an anthropocentric viewpoint. In other words, it's from the viewpoint of us living on earth, see? So the greater light and the lesser light. Okay. Well, it's, yeah, it is less light because the moon reflects what it gets from the sun, but... To us, they're the same size. Okay? Yeah. Oh, anyways. Got distracted. Okay. So, um, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens and to give light on the earth, 
to rule over the day and over the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. See, notice that? So there's still a little bit of tohu going on, but God is continuing to bring order. And everything step that he does is good. Whereas evolution, it would be bad because death is required. Um, let's see, to rule over the day and over the night. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was disorder. And there was morning, there was order the fourth day. Okay, a couple things worth noting here. Okay, so God gives light. But the word forgive is also the word that's used when somebody gives a gift to somebody else. A personal gift to whomever. Okay. So the text is kind of letting us know that God is gifting us with light. And so he's, you know, the text in a sense is planting in us the goodness and the giftedness of light, which will be especially important after the fall into sin. And Jesus comes and he says he is the light of the world. See, so that he's the light of the world, if we go back to creation, oh, he's God's gift to us. We only get that if we go back and we go, oh, I mean, you, you can't prove that, but it's, it's implied, okay, in the text. So it's something very beautiful if we catch these little things, right? So yeah. Well, here's something to think about. What does God do on day one? In the beginning, God created, well, that's verse one. But he, he said, let there be light. Wait a minute. He makes light, and yet, he did not yet create the things that emit light. What's going on? So what's happening in day one? See, God is outside of time. He's eternal. So to be eternal means that you're not constrained by time. So when we go forever and ever, well, that's trying to understand eternity within our human frame, right? Because we're creatures within time. But if you're outside of time, time is, you know, 10 trillion years ago, today doesn't matter, right? To you, it's like the same moment because you're outside of it. And you're, oh, here, here, or whatever, okay? So, which means on day one, God creates time. You have light and day, even though he hadn't yet created the things which give light. Okay? So he's creating time. And so I, we're not going to really get that until we get to day four. And we're like, wait a minute. How could there be day and night when the sun's not even made yet? Right? So, yeah. Yep. yep. So, um, so, yeah, yeah. We can kind of see that um, this also lets us know kind of who God is, how powerful he is. To think time did not even exist until God created it. We don't, like, what? I thought it just always was. If you're eternal, Right? And so now he's, he's kind of making this stuff. So his creation will operate within the realm of time, even though he is not bound by time. Okay? Let's look at day five, verses 20 through 23. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth uh, across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the water swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Okay. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was what? Disorder and order the fifth day. Okay. So what did God make on this particular day? He 
he's now populating the air. Okay? So the word translated for birds is too, bird is too specific. The Hebrew really just means anything that flies. Okay? So I don't know, are there things that fly that may not be birds? Okay, so, but uh, so yeah, so it's just basically flying creatures is really probably a better way to translate that rather than birds. So we have a tendency to try to make this more specific, but it's, you know, it, it's, this is really kind of giving us the broad sweep of things, okay? And then the great sea creatures. Well, in the Hebrew, it's really creatures and then great, <laughs> you know, so the, so the descriptor of what kind of creatures comes after the, after the noun, so the adjective, okay? And that's also the word for reptile. So if this is referring to dinosaurs, this would be when God created them, okay? It's, this is, you know, dinosaurs more of a specific term, but it would kind of fall under kind of these giant creatures, Okay. And uh, it could even be translated as, as um, um, tanin could even be uh, like translated as kind of like a monster or something. So if you watch the, if you watch the, um, some of the sci-fi movies or whatever, kaiju or whatever, you know, those Japanese ones, that would be a tanin or gojida, Godzilla, that would be a tanin. <laughs> Never mind. Did you guys ever see like Godzilla versus King Kong when you were a kid? Ah, okay. Yeah, really bad. Stick was that stick figure stuff? Whatever. I don't know. Pretty pretty bad stuff though. Okay. So that's day five. Do we notice? Do we? Oh, so it's it's being repeated evening and morning. It's not just counting time. It's telling us who God is. He's the God from disorder to order, okay? Day six, part one, okay, verses 24 and 25. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. So here we can even kind of see some general categories, things that are domesticatable and things that are wild or feral, okay? So right here, when we go back to tohu vabohu, the vabohu part, which has a little potential, we see that here, okay, that animals can be domesticated. Hmm. Even though at this point, it doesn't really matter because why? The fall into sin hasn't happened. So this text was written after the fall into sin. Does that make sense? Because you can see here, even though it's telling us what happened before, you can see here that's kind of giving a nod to what can happen after. See? So we kind of see a resiliency or a plasticity to what God created. When he, when, he, when he created stuff to be able to reproduce and thrive. So we see here God creating creatures according to their kind, which is more general than we would say a species. But species is a, is a man-made designation. And we know that it's kind of artificial because you can have species that, could, that are different species but can reproduce, which lets you know that what's greater than species? Um, yeah, yeah, so King Philip caught our family getting stoned. Um, that one, so yeah, whatever. That was what I, that's what my biology teacher taught me in high school. King Philip caught our family getting stoned, so anyways, sorry. Um, that's how I remember the class, phylum, etc. Okay, um, so yeah, so we can kind of see that he's making the land creatures and kind of what's in them. Okay, but God's not yet done because day six is part two. So he's going to make a, another particular land creature, but he will make this creature slightly different. Okay, so what God has been doing so far is that he spoke everything into being, created, and then from there he makes stuff from what he initially spoke into being. 
We will see that with Adam, but with Adam, it's both, and we'll see that. And that's why man is different than the other animals, okay? Um, and uh, so, it's, so it's, it's simply, people couldn't say, well, yeah, but if you look at our DNA, we're like so similar to whatever animals, right? Like we, have, we share 98% of the DNA of something else, right? Well, what does that tell us? It just tells us that the same creator made us, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, so verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Bob, you mentioned Trinity, us, plural. So right now, the text, all we can say from this text is that God is a plurality. We can't state specifically he is a trinity, but we know that he is not a, you know, God, but also plural. And um, so, and we know that also from the Hebrew. Hebrew has a, a number of different names for God, but one of which is Elohim, right? And Elohim is... The, the, the suffix heme means it's plural, even though it's treated as a singular. That's, that's, that's the, right? So, I mean, we have words like that in English, maybe. Like, no, because like sheep. Yeah, deer and deer, but, but when we're talking about two or more deer, deers, we're not using that as a singular. It just functions as either a singular or a plural. So I don't know if we have. We might say, um, we might collectively use the word heart, right? Uh, and even though that's a singular, it, we might use that in a way that it refers to everybody here. Our heart stirred. No, I don't know if that would, not sure. Okay, but so yeah, so the name for God kind of lets us know. And here, let us, so right now, okay. So when we look at the rest of scripture, we, yeah, God is a trinity and he is one and he is three, so on and so forth is part of the great mystery. But here, this is in a sense, God having this inner dialogue within himself. Let us, right? It's like the Father and the Son and the Spirit, right? They're, they're having this conversation. Let us make, notice the word make, a saw, not bara. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God will form man from the stuff he has already made or created. And chapter two will fill in more of the blanks, okay? So he says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. So let's look at that because those are often confusing. They're very similar and you could say even maybe they're saying the same thing, but there are slight differences. So image, selim, is a shadow or physical representation of something. So a selim could be an idol, represent, right? Um, it doesn't have to be, but I'm saying, but it's kind of, so when God says, Let, make him in our image, right there, that implies that we will be a physical creature, okay? Um, not just some abstract spirit being floating in space, okay? But what is likeness? Well, likeness is a little more abstract, but it's, it means similar to. So we're going to be physical representations of God. We're not going to be God, but we will, we will be representations of him similar to. And it, it'll make sense what God says next. So we will, in a sense, be, we will be his kindness to creation. We will be his, his um, love to creation. So in other words, if God were directly managing creation itself, okay, then he would be doing stuff, but he's leaving that to man because we're in his image and likeness, okay? So, so likeness and this similar to, so one is we'll kind of be physical, 
physical beings who, who are like God, but not God, and we will do stuff that he would do if he were directly managing creation, okay? So that's kind of, and, and so we'll see that when we, when we f- press on to the next verses, okay? So let them have dominion, right? So right there, image and likeness, and now why does this matter? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Mankind is supposed to be God's representation to his creation. We are to manage his creation. So we can kind of get the idea of of how he made us to be and what he gives us to do. Be a very fulfilling life. Of course, think about pre-fall world, right? So it would all be joy because there is no, because God has has moved from tohu vabohu to structure and order and everything is good, okay? So we kind of see this all the way through creation. So when we get to the fall, it's doubly shocking because everything is good, right? And then, ah, right? So, okay. So, we can see verse 26. We kind of learn about the Trinitarian nature of God and in the fall into sin. So, in the fall into sin, we lose this. It's kind of a, it's a, what, 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 are, what do doctors call like the appendix they say is a vestigial organ? I don't know. I think they're wrong because they now say it actually has a purpose. But... What we do, so in other words, the image and likeness, it's kind of there as a mutated deformation within us, but it's bent, crooked, corrupted. Um, And so we no longer have that in us for real because because, um, that became a casualty, you know, during our fall into sin. Let's look at verse 27, okay? So God in verse 26 made man. And then we'll realize in chapter 2, he takes the soil. And, and see, and the word Adam kind of means soil man. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah, the name kind of matches how God made him. But let's look at verse 27. Um, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. God made an created man. He initially created everything and then makes stuff. But here, he makes and creates. So he forms, in chapter two we'll see God forms Adam from the soil and he breathes into him the breath of life. That breathing into him is created. See? So, um, so we get a double dose we're made from the stuff that God earlier spoke into being, but he breathes, he creates us different from the other creatures. Okay. Um, so, created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Okay. So, we're slightly different. But that makes sense because God has given us oversight of his creation. Of course, in this fallen world, we've just screwed it up, right? I mean, you know, but what it would have been. Hmm. Okay, so um, let's look at Wisdom 23, 24. God created us for incorruption and made us in the image of his own eternity, meaning, according to Wisdom, that God created us to live forever. No death. See? Um, But through an adversary's envy, death entered the world. We'll get into that next week or the week after. Okay? So just a couple, what did we lose when Adam and Eve fell into sin? The image and likeness of God. It's deformed and whatever is in there. 
So when people say, oh, well, God, I'm made in God's image. I'm not messed up or whatever, whatever. Yeah, we are. Because what God created us originally, that's all deformed because of sin. Okay, so we're taking, we're using a pre-fall description of us to describe a post-fall reality, which is, which is bad, okay? So we were created in God's image, and now what do we have? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but it ain't good, and it ain't pretty, right? That's why we have Jeffrey Dahmers and whatever else. Okay. Oh, yeah, we'll get there. So who now has the image of God? Well, Christians are being recreated in his image, okay? But we still have a fallen sinful nature, so we're still sinful, okay? Uh, page five, the Holy Trinity and creation. I think we kind of covered that. Um, but here's Irenaeus of Lyon, so um, our at the time, it wasn't Lyon in France. It was Lugdunium or something. Still part of the Roman Empire. So he called the Son and the Spirit the two hands of God with which he formed the world. So, yeah. Irenaeus has a lot of good stuff. So if you ever want to read him, start with volumes three and four. Don't skip one and two. There's too much weirdness in those. He's dealing with strange heresies that don't make any sense to us. So you'll, just, you'll be reading a whole thing and you'll find one or two nuggets and you'll just go, man. This Irenaeus dude's impossible to understand. Okay. Let's look at verse 28. And God blessed them. So, so right now, the them is what? Adam and Eve. Okay, so chapter two is going to fill in a lot of the blanks on the specifics. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So what did God tell Adam and Eve to do? Have dominion. Remember, this is pre-fall. So have dominion pre-fall is different from have dominion post-fall, right? Oh, dominion, oh, well, hey, right? So, um, yeah, so in other words, Adam and Eve are his stewards to manage creation. Hmm. Okay. Let's press on, okay. Oh yeah, so I wanted to mention fruitful. It's based on the word fruit. <laughs> well, that is kind of obvious, right? Be fruitful and multiply. But that's really, if, it'd be like taking the noun fruit and turning it into a verb. So be like a fruit. So, um, and you think, well, what, what is fruit like, right? He's not just saying simply reproduce. Right, so uh, I'm thinking. Well, you know, you think about fruit and the seeds within it are often and comes in different colors and great taste, especially pre-fall. Who knows how wondrous the fruits would have been, right? So I think within the context to be fruitful would be have a very fruitful life. Okay, not just be reproducing. See, and then the reproducing part really comes next. Okay, be fruitful and multiply. Become many. Okay? So, I, I, you know, that's kind of the implication is, is that this be fruitful is, is really what? Just delight in the stuff God gives you to do. Live it out in its fullness. And, it, you know, and I would think that it would be wondrous pre-fall. You know, so Scripture doesn't really speak of that, so... And maybe in some ways it would be unrelatable to us, you know. Well, let's, let's press on verses 29 and 30. Oh, I have to hurry up now. Okay. Um, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So in the beginning... Were there any carnivores? No! We were all vegans. Yeah, I still remember like in the 70s looking at hippies who only ate vegetables and they always looked sickly and weak. You know, I, I, I don't think it's a good healthy way to eat now, post fall, but okay. But so there was no death eating animals. So I guess 
right? So we're talking about the breath of life, right? So plants, okay? Um, and then verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was disorder and morning, order the sixth day. Disorder to order. Really, the whole thing concludes in the first three verses in chapter two, but we'll get to that next week. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. As far as we can tell, there's nothing to indicate otherwise. Hmm? So, well, if it wouldn't make sense because if you create something and then you have to wait 10,000 years, how would it live? Right? So, so yeah, I mean, there's no reason to think that day means something other than our understanding of day. Okay? So, next week we'll, we'll start with, the, we'll conclude with, we'll start with the conclusion and then we'll, we'll finish the rest of chapter two, I hope. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, there is much to learn on how you created the earth. Not so much the think in many ways we get lost in some of the specifics but you want us to understand who you are that you are a god of order that you you take mess and you make it good right and salutary you make it perfect we ask that you continue to do that in our lives with your son jesus christ because we have made a mess of things with sin and he your gift of light comes to make things right Grant us such faith all our days that we may turn to him and look to him for our salvation. In whose name we pray, amen.